Hi, this is Elisa Jones, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on 3SERKC Radio. Um, what would you say was your earliest musical memory from your childhood? When can you remember music first becoming an important part of your life? Ooh, my first musical memory. Um, I would say when I was, uh, I was, I think I was about three. I, uh, my household was very musical and my mom was a professional singer and, um, and so, you know, I remember being three years old having one of those, um, you know, little wooden pianos like Linus, or not Linus, uh, what's his name off of the, the, the peanut, um, Oh, I forgot his name. The piano player. Oh, anyway, Schroeder. Schroeder. Pianos and, um, Schroeder, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I remember tinkering around with that and then, and then, you know, my older siblings got a hold of it and broke it. Um, and then after that, you know, my mom taught us to sing and harmonize and I was about five when my part was the third. So, um, yeah, I, I think I was just like thrown in it very early. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your mother. I believe she had the opportunity to uh, seriously pursue a recording career, but but chose not to. Yeah, she um she sang in bands, uh, lived in California, and um, you know was offered a recording contract with um, Barry Gordy, and you know she chose raising her family over it, which I think was very noble. <laughs> I don't think I would do the same thing, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you can have both. You know, I can raise a family and, and do my career. So, yeah. um, you know, but I think at the time, I think the woman's role was a lot different. So probably in the in the 70s, that's, that's why she made the decision that she did. Yeah. Do you think seeing that choice that your mother made has made you think about, and, and probably in the past she probably has thought about what might have been, has that been an inspiration for you to, to make the most of your opportunities? Oh, more than certainly. Like looking at her situation and just seeing my mother's dynamic personality and, you know, how she's just, she is a star. Like when she walks in the room, everybody just stops to see who that is. Her personality is so exciting and overwhelming that um, I think that sometimes all that energy has nowhere to go. So mm. it's unfortunate. And I and I think, oh, my gosh, you know, she could be this and that and so much happier. Not to say she's not happy now, but I think, you know, she would have reached um, her personal success had she pursued it. So because of that, um, I look at the same situation and I and I say to myself, there's there's no way that I'm not going to, uh, you know, do the, do the most that I can and pray to God that, you know, doors open and, and um, stones go, oh, you know, turned and I find something. But I think at the end of the day, I can be peaceful that I didn't walk away. I, I continue to pursue. Now, your website states that you've uh, got a catalogue of about 250 original songs. You've released three yes. three CDs to date, so my mathematics tell me there's a lot of unrecorded songs there. How do you go about working through all of those unrecorded songs and selecting the ones that you put that you put on your uh, CD projects to date? Well, you know, it's it's funny because um, when I when I first originally did the first CD, um, I I specifically took tunes that were um, fitting to who I was at the time. And so, you know, some of the songs were were bad songs, and some of them were actually quite good, but it just wasn't who I was anymore. And then um, the same thing happened when I released this melody. It was like this was the type of person or where I was at emotionally and mentally at that time, and then the last CD anymore, um, the same thing. Unfortunately, like, I think there was a a little more time between this melody and any more than I would have liked. So I had to wean it down from 30 songs that I had chosen for the CD. I weaned it down to 25 and then down to 15, and I finally made the final cut to 12. Mm -hmm. So after doing that and seeing how painful that was to not record some of my favorite songs, um, I chose for this, because we're in the studio recording as we speak, and um, so right now I've decided, you know, every year because I write, I'm very prolific that every year I'm going to release a new CD. So this way I don't have to say no to any song. <laughs> 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 you know, like I can just record them all. 
So. A prolific, you certainly are. Is it more of a natural instinct for you just to, to sit down and write? It's not, not as much of a chore as it might be for some songwriters? You know, I, I think I've been blessed. Um, you know, and it took me a while to accept the fact that, I, that I'm a truly uh, a writer. Um, but I think I've been blessed with the, you know, with, with the um, gift of, you know, writing. I feel that the songs aren't, I don't create. I think they're just given to me mm-hmm. and I just put them down. So when a song is ready, I, I get, I know this is crazy sounding, but I get like this tingly feeling. And then I just have this like little voice going, we have a song, it's, it's ready. And then all of a sudden the song comes out and, and, and I don't even have to work hard anymore. Whereas before I would spend days on a song and now like the song comes and I'm done with it within a couple of hours at the most. You know, right. I'll write a song in like 15 minutes. So like when it's there, it's, it's ready. I believe you were seven years old when you wrote your first song. How long did it take before that that confidence really started to set in with with yourself and your writing? You know, believe it or not, it took... Because I never looked at my music to let other people listen to. I just wrote it because there were songs that were being played on the radio that I didn't want to hear. Um, There were melodies that I thought I wanted... You know, music is supposed to express how you feel, and who better to express it than myself. So... It was more of uh, it was more of therapy for me, you know. And so I write about anything that happens in my life. I write about it. And it wasn't until my um, sophomore year in college when I decided to, you know, release the first CD um, that I even let the band members like when they were, we were rehearsing it. I was like, oh my gosh, they can hear my words. I felt like they sat in my room and read all of my diaries. <laughs> it was very difficult you know <laughs> and now people listen to them and they come to me and they ask me questions about my songs and i'm like you know yeah it's a personal time but it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so initially yeah. who, were, who were some of the songwriters that initially inspired you to to sit down and want to write yourself oh my gosh my favorite songwriter is burt Bacharach. oh yeah he's incredible and uh like he's he's a songwriter whose melodies just penetrate my soul and it's like the music goes right where it needs to go every time. Um, I love Carol King. I love James Taylor. Um, and, and it's funny because all these people are before my time, but I think I was just raised with really, around really good music. And, um, Smokey Robinson is a great songwriter. Um, you know, it, it's, there are just some really, really blessed writers that, that, you know, truly, truly have a gift. So those are the ones that I tend to, to gravitate towards um, more current people. I love like uh, Sarah McLaughlin. I think she's a wonderful songwriter as well. Now you, you studied violin, so obviously that was a, a serious focus for you at, at one point. Was there a defining moment where you had to make a decision wh- which way to go? Was it down that track or, or with your songwriting? Oh, it's so funny because you know, because I wasn't looking at myself as a songwriter, I just looked at it like, oh, I write songs when I'm sad. Or I write songs, you know, when I'm upset or happy or angry. Um, so I went to school and my major was uh, violin and performance and education. Um, and so I studied, you know, I'm a classical violinist. And um, and so it was there that, I, you know, I was like, oh, trying to do the singer-songwriter thing. Mm. And the engineer, when I was recording the first CD, said to me, um, you know, you, I'm, and I, the comment I made was, oh, I'm a violinist who just happens to write songs. And he's like, no, sweetheart, you're not. You're a songwriter who happens to play violin. And I just <laughs> disagreed with it, you know. And then finally, I think it was like a year or two later when I realized that I'm my happiest when I'm playing my music. And I'm like, he was so right. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I am a songwriter that happens to play violin. Uh-huh. But the great thing um, here recently, now that I added a guitar player to my band, um, I've been able to introduce, you know, I can like put down my instrument and just break out on my on my violin and just rip it, and it's it's so nice to be able to put all of my world together finally. The singer, the writer, the violinist, I can keep them all together, and it's very nice. And you are still involved in a couple of string quartets too, aren't you? Oh yes, yes, yes. I love playing classical music. I love chamber music. So um, that keeps me busy, and you know, we play around and do concerts and private parties, and you know, I enjoy that a lot. And does that help your own music too? You think having that other creative outlet? You know, it does. It keeps me structured. It keeps me, um, you know, engaged and involved in, in um, what I call like high intellectual, you know, 
stimulating music. Um, and, you know, it just, it just keeps me well-rounded, I think, as a, as a musician, because I listen to every kind of music, from rap to country, um, you know, which for some, that's a good thing. I think for me as a songwriter, it makes me a little more um, schizophrenic, and I'm all over the place. But um, I think the classical realm just really helps me become disciplined and focused. And, you know, I think there's a nice balance to be free-spirited and also to be controlled. So classical music is very controlling. (laughs) 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 But I don't have any hang-ups about it. (laughs) There is a great diversity in your music and a great diversity in the artists that you've worked with over the years and shared stages with. There, everybody from Bobby V to Pete Seeger. Has it been important for you from day one to, to be versatile <laughs> like that? I do. <laughs> well, some ticket to Bobby V. It's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, it's, I'm a fan of them all. And Pete Seeger is just an amazing, an amazing artist and um, songwriter. So, you know, I, I've gotten really into folk music and, um, you know, and where I live is just like folk music city. So it's just great. Yeah. Yeah, that is funny. Hearing <laughs> Ray Charles to Pete Seeger. <laughs> <laughs> you spent five years with Wilson Pickett, uh, including a, a trip to Australia. How do you look back on, on your time with Wilson there? Oh, my gosh. You know, I loved Australia. And um, where are you calling from? Just out of curiosity, what part? Uh, Melbourne. Oh my God, I love Melbourne. That was my favorite place. Out of everybody there was just so sweet. And I, that, that was the first place that we went to was Melbourne. And I, I remember thinking, wow, like if I lived anywhere, because we went to Sydney and Brisbane and Perth. And, but I remember thinking, if I moved here, like I, I want to live in Melbourne. It was just like a nice place that fit. But, um, no, it was a great, it was a great, um, I think we spent about two weeks there, two and a half weeks there. Mm-hmm. It was a great tour, and everyone there is just so nice and like friendly and loving of music and appreciative. And it was it was a it was nice to get away because like you don't really get that in the states as often. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was nice to be over there and, and to have people just really appreciate art. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to say anything bad about the states, but you know what I mean. It's, yeah. it's the truth. So. I just, I don't know. I really enjoyed my time over there. And um, that was when we went on tour with Ray Charles. And uh, that was just a beautiful experience. That's right, yeah. Great, yeah, great time, you know. And I was there, I think it was late summer for you guys. That's right. It would have been our festival session. I think you played a festival here in Melbourne, uh, our international music festival. Yeah, it was like, uh, what was it, in February? Yes, that's right. March, yeah. yeah. Late summer, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, gen- generally yeah. working working with Wilson Pickett through those years, what what do you think uh, you learned from him in terms of uh, being a band leader now that you're fronting your own band? Oh, you know, it it was he basically you know taught me how to work an audience. Um, he knew how to make his audience just enjoy every second of his show, and he knew how to make his band feel like everybody was equally important. You know, he would take in one of the songs, uh, it would vary, but uh, a lot of, oftentimes he did it in Mustang Sally, where he'd go around the whole band and give everyone a feature. And I'm like, that's just great. It's, you know, he was one of those artists where it's like, it's not just about me, check out my band. And mm-hmm. I find myself doing that. And I don't even think about it, but I'm like, I, I do that with every time. And, and I often do it when I do Mustang Sally, because I do cover um, that piece, you know, in, in honor and memory of the Hicket. Oh, that's um, but, you know, it's like, it, I think that was one of the greatest things, and he just knew how to rock his audience, and that was, I, I mean, every time I was on stage with him, I felt like I was a fan that got to be on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, I never felt like I was working. It was like, wow, what is he going to do tonight, you know? Talk about your, your songwriting process. Do you write mainly on, on piano or guitar, or, or can that vary from, from song to song? Well, it's quite funny, because... Um, my uh, second to violin, my next instrument was piano. And so I only wrote on piano. And then um, about, I, when I released this melody, I just bought a guitar. And I taught myself a little bit. And so I wrote a song, Holven, which is on this melody. And it was used to be young. And so I could, you know, I fiddled around, could barely play it, but we re- played it enough to record it. And then after that, you know, I still didn't really play guitar as much, except for on like a few songs. And then, um, and then after I started gigging over the, like two years ago, three years ago, 
where I just started working a lot. Um, it was getting really cumbersome bringing a 100-pound piano with me everywhere I went, and I had to have roadies carry it. So I decided, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to buy another guitar and just learn everything on guitar, and if I can't learn it, I'm going to write it. And and now my main axe is guitar. <laughs> 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 I miss my piano. I'm like, oh, I haven't played piano in so long. You know, now that we're recording... Um, I'm sorry, now that we're recording, I... Um, I, I actually played the piano, and I, I was like, oh, I missed this. So we're actually trying to figure out how to incorporate the piano back into, uh, back into you know, the act without mm. me having to carry around a 100-pound piano. <laughs> so I think now, as of late, all of my songs over the last um, year, two years, have been written on guitar, mm. the rest of the piano. Yeah. Are you one of those writers that always has a notebook uh, on hand? Do you like to carry ideas around with you for a while before you commit them to, to paper? You know, I actually, I don't do that. When it pops in my head and a song pops in my head and, and I'm not in a position to where I can, like, sit down and sing it or play it, I grab my cell phone and I send myself a message. So I'll call myself and leave myself a voice message. Oh, yeah. Um, and currently my mailbox is full and everybody hates it. <laughs> <laughs> All my songs are on there, you know, so I think if I don't clear out my mailbox, I only have four open spots. So if I don't clear it out, people can't leave messages and I get very angry. <laughs> but um, I record in my cell phone and then I go back and listen. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me write that song. And then I write it up and then I can, you know. But then I have a problem deleting it because I'm like, I like to listen back to see what the song first started out as, yeah. you know, <laughs> and how it evolved. So. Looking at your, your show uh, archive list on, on your website, it looks like you've been playing primarily in, in the New York area for the, for the past year. Are there plans to, to broaden that in, in the new year? Yes, definitely. Um, that's what we're working on now. I'm trying to um, get an agent because, as you know, festivals and things are hard to um, procure when you're unsolicited. So... Um, we're trying to get an agent so that we can do like the music festivals and the international things and, um, and just to broaden our horizons because the local things are easier to get, but when you, when you don't have the inside man doing it for you, it, it makes it a little difficult. Mm. So yes, that's the goal of 2010 for the Aretha Jones band is to, uh, is to broaden and do a tour. Um, we've also talked about, you know, booking a tour for the summer to, um, you know, to go various places. Mostly, we would like to leave the country. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I know it's crazy, but I'm like, hey, I think big, you know. Yeah. So, tell us about about your band members and and the background of some of the people in your band. Okay, um, my bass player is uh, Mickey Kopchak. He's an incredible um, bassist. He played with uh, Dizzy Gillespie. Um, you know, he's just he's been a blessed musician as well. And he's wonderful on improvisation. He's been in my band since uh, the beginning of, or the middle of 2007. And um, we currently have a new drummer. His name is Mike Hickey. And uh, he, too, has been um, touring around with various artists. And, um, you know, he joined the band, I would say, about maybe eight months ago. And my guitar player, Mark McNutt, he, it's kind of funny because we all come from different backgrounds, which makes the band work. Mm -hmm. You know, my bass player is a jazz guy. I mean, total jazz guy who improvs. My drummer is a heavy metal rocking drummer. <laughs> and <laughs> my guitar player is from down south. <laughs> he's from Tennessee. So he's like this country guy, you know. <laughs> and all these elements make a, a incredible band, you know. So they can all fit every style of music. You know, I'll pull out a rock song, and like I did this, I wrote a song on violin and instrumental. It's, it's a rock song, and my drummer just kicked right in where he's supposed to be. And then like my country tunes, my um, guitar player um, Mark, he just you know he knows the little country lines and the slides, and it's wow. it's actually it's quite nice. You know, most people wouldn't want musicians like that, but <laughs> I feel completely blessed. <laughs> So that's so. that adaptability. That that's what you look for in a musician to to work with. Exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, and they have to be able to not only adapt, but the musician has to be, um, you know, just able to to put themselves out there and you know jump on a song that they've never heard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
because I, I don't like to rehearse as often because, you know, we're all very busy people. And I feel if you're good, I'll give you a recording, you do your homework, and if you fit, then when we play together, it's just going to work. And so I send out the MP3s. If, if I write a new song, I'm like, here's a new song I wrote. You know we're going to do it at the show. So I give them the CD or the MP3. They learn it. We play it at the gig. And um, I find that musicians that don't like to work that way don't work well with me just because I'm a very free-spirited kind of, uh, you know, fly by the skin of my pants um, or the seat of my pants kind of girl, you know. I like the excitement. <laughs> so... I saw on, on both the CDs you sent down to me on the, on the liner notes you thanked your students. So I, I assume by that you're doing some teaching of some kind? Yes. Um, I'm a music teacher. I teach strings. And, um, you know, I feel that, that, you know, when you're teaching someone, you have to organize the information so well in your brain that, you know, in order to produce information to give to someone else on how to execute it properly. And... You know, and I feel that my students really do make me a better musician. Mm-hmm. They stretch me. You know, I have a student currently who looks at me and he's like, you know, and he's talking this stuff to me about, like, the Tchaikovsky and, and, and Isaac Perlman. And, and it, you know, I'm like, wow, you know, yeah, i, I got to start reinvestigating this again. And I'll go back and do my homework and yada, yada, yada. And it just makes me, and they, they just keep you always wanting to be alive and a better musician than just being stagnant. So at least that's how I feel with my students. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I I thank them all the time because I think every CD, and they'll, or they'll give me ideas or, you know, they'll say something crazy to me and then I'm like, you know, I should write a song about you <laughs> making me feel this way. And I write a song and I'm like, see, this would have never happened had you not said that to me, you know? <laughs> so I, I always thank them and uh, let them know. And I even have students whom I'll have come out of my private studio and I'll ask them to perform concerts with me um, on selective tunes, just because I think that's a learning experience also for them to learn how to perform. Absolutely, so, yeah. So what, yeah. Are, what are some of the, the main frustrations you've found of, of being an independent musician? You know, I, it's, it's one of those situations where it's not what you know, it's who you know. And when you're an independent musician, um, you're not in the loop. And every every place you go has click. It's kind of like being in school, you know. And if you're not in with the in crowd, then you're not in. Yeah. And I find that, you know, it's hard. Like, radio play is difficult because you, you have to be on the mainstream, on the major label um, to get, you know, major airplay on your CDs. Um, I find that, you know, like I said, the festivals are difficult to land without, you know, the great agents. Um it's, I, I would say that right now that is my biggest frustration because I, I've been very um, lucky to have developed a wonderful fan base here in New York. And, um, you know, they come out, they support the shows, they support me, and, you know, and, and they come regularly to see to see me, to see us. And, you know, I feel that that, that could easily be time, you know, 100 million if only you know, it would fall in the right places for people to hear it. But, you know, you can't have people hear it if you can't get into the loop. So I think that's the biggest frustration I have, is trying to break into the circle. And do you look far ahead from time to time? Like, for example, where would you like to to see yourself in, say, five years? Yes, I do. And, And I set goals for myself, you know. Sometimes they come to fruition, and sometimes I have to extend the deadline. Um... But I, I do see myself um, 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 continuing to do this and, um, you know, to go to such lengths as, you know, like I said, to, I told the band, I want to travel. Um, I want I want to break out of the United States. I want, you know, I want to just make sure that it's heard. And, and I'm not looking to um, to be like a Madonna, but... I am looking to at least make a living at what I do and what I love to do. So that is my goal, and I feel that, and, you know, within the next few years, that will come to fruition. Um, I think I'll be able to successfully do my music and live peacefully, financially, <laughs> you know? Uh, any any fresh recording plans, if you had any? Uh, yeah, so um, we have already started this fourth CD, Um the tentative title is Bruised, Not Broken, 
and uh, it's going to have approximately 14 songs on it, uh, two of which are violin instrumentals with, with my band. Um, and, you know, it's just like a, a self-reflective CD over the last year, um, year, maybe a year and a couple months of my life. And, you know, and I feel that entirely as a person that, you know, I'm bruised, but I'm not broken. And um, there's hope. So... I'm actually really looking forward to the release of the CD, and um, I think the date that we have set to release the CD is going to be April 3rd, 2010, so ah, in a few months. <laughs> not too far away. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it's very it's very quick. So, yes, uh, last time I, I cut it really close by, you know, having the CDs arrive the day before the CD release party and... It was pretty stressful. So this time, you know, I'm hoping to have the CDs a lot, uh, arrive at the beginning of March. Um, so this way, at the beginning of April, we'll be good. <laughs> so I have, I'll be, pre- I'll be recording all of this month and all of January, and then February we'll be mixing. So oh, fantastic! Yeah, we're almost done. Oh, yeah, I'm well, excited. We'll keep a lookout for that. Lisa, thanks so much for your time. It's uh, been a pleasure catching up with you today. Thank you so much, John, for like calling and thinking of me and having me on your show. I'm really appreciative. We certainly hope that uh, next time you're down in Australia, it's with your own band and and playing your own music for us. We'd certainly love to see that. Oh, you and me both. (laughs) (laughs) There, I'll put that in my five-year plan. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. I will be in Melbourne (laughs) within the next five years. (laughs) That would be that would be special. Okay, best of luck with the remainder of the recording, and uh, we'll look out for that in April. Okay, thank you so much. All the best. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.